Good morning, Port City Church. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. If you're ready to worship, would you stand to your feet? Welcome to all of you online and here in person. We have so much to celebrate. And the reason that we come Sunday after Sunday is to testify of all that God's done during the week. And this week, this Sunday in particular, we have so much to be grateful for. Looking back on the last four years, we're here to testify that we worship a God who's been faithful. We worship a God who's been good. So let's stand to our feet. Let's put our hands together like this, front to back, as we give honor and praise to King Jesus. this morning as we continue to worship as we continue to sing all that he has for us new life here this morning lonely my sorrow and dead in my 
passing Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My open heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He canceled my debt And he called me his friend
worship him with you. You may be seated. Amen, amen, amen. When we speak the name of Jesus over the darkness in our lives, that darkness trembles. Is that right, church? Amen. amen, amen. Hey, it is so good to be here with you guys this morning. And for those joining us online as well, we are so glad that you're with us. Uh, my name is Josh Lester, and I have the privilege of serving as a student ministries pastor here at Port City Church. And I believe that the best place for you to be on a Sunday morning is right here at Port City Church. So we are so glad that you are here and that you're tuning in with us here this morning. Uh, maybe you're new, maybe you've been coming to Port City for a while, you're not yet plugged into Port City. One of the ways that people get plugged in here at the church is through our Connect card. And so on the screen behind me should be a uh, QR code that you can scan with your iPhone. I don't know if it works with Androids, haven't tried it out. iPhone superior, so you can scan with your iPhone. Gotcha, Wendy. So you can scan with your iPhone or your phone, or maybe the Android will work, I don't know. But if you want a physical copy out in the lobby at our welcome desk, there's a physical copy of the Connect card. And it's just an opportunity for you to, to fill that out. And one of our team members I'd love to reach out to you this week uh, to talk through what's going on here at Poor City in ways that you can get involved and plugged in here at the church as well. Uh, at this time in our service, I want to go ahead and invite our team up as we uh, continue in our worship to God through our generosity. And I just want to pause here for a moment uh, and just acknowledge that for some of us, this part in our service can sometimes feel a little bit awkward. Uh, and I just want to like make known that this part in our service really is for those that call Port City home and give financially to the mission to reach our city restore the broken, and to release with purpose. Uh, we believe that generosity is a mindset that, that God wants all of us to have and desires all of us to have. The Bible says that, that uh, God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, and we want our church to be a generous church to be able to help fund the ministry here to reach our city, restore the broken, and to release with purpose. And so if you are one of those people that call Port City home and give financially to our mission, we just want to say thank you so much for partnering with us as we reach our city, restore the broken, and release with purpose. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, so while they're passing the buckets around, just a few things uh, to make sure that you are all aware of. This Thursday, November 9th, is our women's gathering that's called Gratitude. Uh, I just talked with Becky Saw this morning, and in fact, there's 140 or 140 women uh, that have already signed up and registered to go to the women's event this Thursday night, which is just absolutely incredible. Uh, but also, if you are a woman and you're wanting to go to this event this Thursday, I want you to know that registration closes this afternoon. So if you have not registered yet for the women's gathering called Gratitude, attitude this Thursday. Uh, make sure that you register this afternoon. You can go to wearepoorcity.com and register there, or you can go to the welcome desk and register at the welcome desk as well in the lobby. Uh, again, registration is closing this afternoon, so you want to make sure that you get in as soon as possible. Uh, also, every single week here uh, in this part of our service, we say a big welcome to everybody that's online, uh, or everybody that's in person, and a big welcome to all those who are online as well. And just so you guys know, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but there's over about a, like, there's a couple hundred people that actually tune in to our online services each and every single week. And every single week, we want to say a big welcome to you. But we also want to let you know that if you're tuning in online this Sunday, in two weeks, uh, we want to make sure that you are here in person. We want to personally invite you to be here at church as we get to celebrate all of what God is doing here at Poor City, but also be able to celebrate the results of our Firm Foundation campaign as a church together. And so we want to make sure that if you're online and you haven't yet joined us in person, make sure that you're here if you're in the Muskegon area. And for those that are in person today, make sure that you put that on your calendar that you're here in two weeks to celebrate with us as we celebrate the results of the Firm Foundation campaign. Well, every single week, last couple weeks, as we have opened up into the message, uh, we've shared a video of some people in our church um, who call Port City home, who, who lives have been radically transformed by the person of Jesus. And so here in a moment, we get to hear Jeff Rake's story of how God has been moving in his life over the last couple years uh, and what, he, what God has done in his life through this church to help impact Jeff's life. And so I want to go ahead and turn your attention to the screen as we get to check out Jeff's story. So go ahead and check out this video. My name is Jeff, and I found community, family, and contentment at Port City Church. About 13 years ago, I uh, lost a good friend to cancer. And then within a few months of that, um, I went through a pretty ugly divorce. Um, I uh, was dealing with um, betrayal, uh, shame, and, uh, and loss. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine at work, and uh, he said, you know, you should try my church. And uh, I had been going to, to church, but I, I, I wasn't feeling like I was getting um, there what I needed. So, uh, so I tried, I tried uh, 
this church. I came here and uh, and I came a few times and uh, I heard the gospel like I had never heard it before. And um, I learned about a God who um, came down from heaven and uh, had flesh and bone and feelings and, and, and all that. He was a man. And um, he also dealt with betrayal and loss. And then he took my shame and all my other sins and took it to the cross. Um, and uh, I had a, a true encounter with Jesus Christ and he changed my life. With that, I mean, who wouldn't have contentment? Christ has given me everything I needed. I need and um, you know eventually here I met my wife uh, I've had kids come to uh, relationship with Jesus Christ here themselves and um, I've met and have uh, true and lasting friendships um, and I just love my church because I found contentment and family and community here uh, I want other people to find that um, here we get the gospel and every week we we find out who Jesus is and what he's done for us and uh, I just want other people to have that. It's thrilling what God is doing in our church and how he's saving people and not just one person but multiple people and how f entire families are being transformed with the gospel. And I don't know about you, I just want to see more of that. Um, I want to see more and more people in our community giving their life to Jesus because it changes absolutely everything. Well, today it's here. It is Pledge Sunday in our Firm Foundation Vision campaign and we've been praying hard these last four weeks. Uh, it's a prayer that we've been praying praying together as a church as a church lord what do you want to do through me at Port City Church so that more people can be found? And that's what we want to be about as a church. We want to be about a, uh, the, the, the will of God, the mission of God here in this community to see lives transformed. Now, if you are new here today, uh, let me say this. You came on a very unique Sunday. Uh, most Sundays aren't like uh, today, but I'm glad you're here. And so later on when we uh, kind of do our pledges later on in the service, at the tail end of the service, let me encourage you, just sit back and relax. I believe that you'll probably um, get some encouragement from today's message, but at the end of the service, I'm just hoping that you leave here inspired because you've seen a group of people who are collectively willing to do whatever God has called us to do to see more people find that relationship with Jesus. So today I want to start with a story in Joshua chapter 4. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there with me. Joshua chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, it's all right. We got the words on the the screen uh, behind me. So let me give you uh, the backdrop to this story. Forty solid years prior to Joshua chapter 4, the Israelites, they had the opportunity to go into the promised land. But because of their fear, because of their lack of trust in God, they ended up freezing. And because they froze and didn't follow God, uh, they wanted, ended up spending the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Now, that brings us to Joshua chapter 4. We are about a generation afterwards, and then you have a new group of people that are ready to jump into the promised land. And the only thing that was standing between them and the promised land was this big old river called the Jordan River. And at that season in Joshua chapter 4, it was during flood stage. So the waters were incredibly high. They knew they needed to get across the water, but they didn't know how it was going to work. And I need to say this really at the beginning of this message, but this is always going to be the case. When you are here and God has called you over here, there are going to be obstacles in between. There's going to be different obstacles, different excuses that could be made, different fears that will try to cripple you. But the interesting thing that you'll find is that God will help you through that. You just have to go. So whatever stands between you and what God is calling you to do, just be ready that it'll likely be at flood stage. Like the Jordan River, it will threaten to drown you. Like the Jordan River, it will threaten to take you underneath. But yet... God always calls us to things that will require us to step out in faith. 
It's just a normal thing for the Christian life. So in Joshua chapter 3, here's what's going on. Uh, that comes right before Joshua 4, just so you're aware. Um, in Joshua chapter 3, Joshua, he gathers all the people together to go ahead and cross the river. This time they're actually going to do it. So you have this long group of people that are going to cross the river. It starts with the priests. The priests are leading the way, and the priests are carrying what is called the Ark of the Covenant. And so the priests, they're walking up to the edge of the river, and as soon as they put their foot in the water, you know what happens? The water splits in two. And these priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, it's a beautiful symbol that when we have God leading the way, the rivers will split. The raging waters will calm down and you'll be able to cross. And so the priests, they take off across the water. The river splits, followed by 40,000 soldiers. Okay? After the soldiers are getting across, then the rest of the nation of Israel is crossing. And then at the very end, uh, the caboose, if you will, there are 12 guys uh, that each, repre each one represents the different tribes of the nation of Israel. And they're crossing across on dry ground. That's where we find ourselves in Joshua 4. You ready to get after it? All right, let's do it. All right, Joshua 4, verse 1, it says, When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. All right, verse 4, it says, Then Joshua called the 12 men, from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, What do these stones mean to you? Verse 7, then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial for Ever. All right, so here's the big idea that I want you to see from Joshua chapter 4. It's simply this. Remembering God's faithfulness from the past allows us to trust him in the present. Remembering God's faithfulness, the way he's been faithful in the past, it allows us to trust him in the present. You want to know how you're going to cross the river that's raging in front of you right now? You want to know how you're going to win the battles that you're currently in? You want to know how you're going to succeed in the future? It's simply by remembering his faithfulness in the past, remembering that he's going to continue to be faithful to you right now, and he will be faithful down the road too. It all comes down with remembering. And today as a church, we're taking a big step of faith. And as we take this step of faith, there's a lot of things that are going to go through your mind. But we have to remember that God will always be faithful. But we have to remember. Any of you struggle with remembering? Yeah, maybe a, a slight bit, you know. We struggle with this a lot. I mean, if you're like, Steve, I don't struggle with this. All right, like, if you're a woman and you're married right now, ask your husband when your anniversary is. See how that goes, okay? All right, when was your first day? Did you see how he does with that? But remembering is important. It's actually ingrained into us because memories do different things to us. Sometimes it's different smells that, you know, bring up a certain memory. Like you smell that cologne or perfume and you think about your first date. Or maybe you, you smell that apple pie and it immediately takes you all the way back to grandma's house and all the memories that are there. Sometimes it's, you know, there's the fun conversations where we start, it, start the conversation with, hey, do you remember when this took place? See, memories are important. Uh, they're important to us. They're also important to God. Um, here in the Old Testament, what you'll often see is that whenever God did some big work where, you know, there's no way you can explain it away. It's just God came in and do a, did a miracle. What you often see in the Old Testament is God commands the people to erect a stone altar. 
so that it could remind the people of how faithful God has been. And that's what you're seeing here in this story. And that's one of the reasons why we have that 10,000 pound rock that we put out outside the doors out here. Because we want you to remember when you see that rock that Jesus is our rock. And if we build our lives on that foundation, we too will be solid and stable. If we build our church on the foundation of Jesus, we will be able to step out of that rock in full boldness, accomplishing whatever he's called us to do. Why? Because we're connected and we're found in Jesus Christ. So here, by putting these 12 stones together in the promised land, God wanted the people to remember a lot of different things. And so the story that you see in Joshua 4, it's a whole lot bigger than just this one chapter. In fact, this story goes all the way back 400 plus years. And when the people saw the stones that were there, it was to remind them of God's faithfulness in the past. So I want to talk about three of those things that are very specific in this broader story of the things that we need to remember about God. The first one is this. Remember God is the deliverer. Remember that our God is the deliverer. Again, these 12 stones, they were visual evidence that in the moment of crisis, you don't know what to do, that God will provide a way. He will deliver us through the raging waters of our lives. He does every single time, but sometimes we forget. Do you remember another time when God split the waters for the nation of Israel? If you don't remember, it's okay because the nation of Israel would often forget this as well. But I want to tell you this full story. So back in the book of Exodus, the Israelites, they were trapped in slavery for about 430 years. And God raises up a man by the name of Moses. And Moses... <clears throat> He went to Pharaoh, and when he got to Pharaoh, what did he do? You sing it with me. We got to do this every time, right? Let my people go. Yeah. All right. So Pharaoh, you know, he, he listens to Moses saying, let my people go. And what does Pharaoh do? He says, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to let them go. And so what does God do in response to that? He starts to send the plague. So the Nile River is turned into uh, blood. There's frogs, there's gnats, there's flies everywhere. There's boil, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, country music, just some of the most awful stuff that God sends into so that Pharaoh was like, I can't take it anymore. And, but that wasn't enough. And so the last plague that was sent was the angel of death that passed over the houses of Egypt. And if you remember this part of the story, the houses that were saved were the ones that had the blood of a perfect lamb that was over the doorpost of that house. And that evening when the angel of death passed over those houses, if it was covered, then no death happened. Life was continuing on. But if the doorposts weren't covered, then death came to the firstborn in that household. Scary stuff, right? And in Pharaoh's house, his firstborn son died. It's all a big picture, though, pointing us to the cross. Because what happened at the cross? Jesus Christ, he was bloodied on the cross, right? He died that perfect sacrifice, and his sacrifice covered those who follow him. So that death no longer has a sting anymore. Now we have eternal life through Jesus who has covered us. Now, the Bible refers to this as the Passover back then, right? Jews, they would celebrate the Passover meal every single year as a reminder of this story. Uh, if you continue on through the New Testament, communion is actually a, an outgrowth of the Passover meal, where it's a reminder again of God's faithfulness to us again and again and again. So Pharaoh, he let the people go, and then it hit him. Oh no, what did I do? Why did I let these people go? They are my free labor. I kind of want them back. And so the nation of Israel had been released. They're taken off. Now Pharaoh, he sends his entire army after the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, they get their backs up against the Red Sea, and they don't know where to turn or where to go. What does God do? What does he do? He, remember, he splits the waters so that 
He delivered the people by them walking across the water on, or walking across the land on dry ground. And then as soon as the, the, uh, the Egyptian army came and the Israelites were in safety, what happened? The water came flooding in over them. Again, God delivered them. Now, how in the world could you forget that? I mean, think about it. If you had a, the biggest, baddest army in the world chasing after you, you're stuck in a position, you don't know where to go, and then God miraculously splits the water so you can walk across on dry land, and he delivers you in that way, how in the world could you forget? It's crazy, isn't it? Until you think about how much we forget of the greatest sacrifice and how we were delivered. See, every time we sin or every time we don't step out in faith that God calls us to take that step of faith, we're, we're forgetting too. In the nation of Israel, they struggled with it a lot. There's in fact 87 verses in the Old Testament that has the exact same line. Remember the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Remember the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. You think I'm repetitive. Remember the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. This said over and over and over again, but yet they forgot. If we're going to be taking the steps of faith that God has called us to, we have to remember that we have a God who will deliver us. We have to remember that we have a God who has delivered us from the greatest penalty of sin that's ever been out there. And because of Jesus Christ on the cross, we've been delivered. Our feet are upon the rock. So that's one thing that these stones, these 12 stones, were to, to bring back to their minds that God is our deliverer. The second thing we see that we're supposed to remember is this. Number two, remember God is the provider, which means this. We don't need to worry about what's happening right now. We don't need to worry about what might happen tomorrow because God is our provider. So after crossing the Red Sea, the Israelites, um, they struggle with their disobedience. See, Moses led the Israelites all the way up to the edge of the river, and God says, take it, and they're like, I don't know if I want to do this or not. And because they didn't, because they were disobedient, what happened? They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, in the middle of all of their wandering, you know what God did? He continued to provide. And I think that might be one of the biggest encouragements to all of us, even when we struggle, even when we've been disobedient, God still provides. That's called grace. He's constantly doing things for us that we don't deserve. So these people, they're wandering around in the wilderness. One of the things that they needed more than anything else was what? It was food. And back then in the wilderness, they didn't even have a McDonald's back then. No, which, believe it or not, isn't really much food at all. But, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. But anyway, they had absolutely nothing. And so God provided for them a food, a miraculous food, that was called manna that came down with the dew in the evenings. Now, here's what's interesting about and how this ties into this story. Remember how I said that the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant across the river? You know what was inside of the Ark of the Covenant? There was one jar of manna which was to remind, again, the people that God will always provide for them. Now, manna, it's interesting. Manna, the word, it literally means, what is it? And from all of my theological studies, um, you know, I think it's basically a mix between Twinkies and a protein bar, something kind of in that realm. I personally like to refer to manna as manana bread. Um, you can write that down in your notes. But here's the deal. Um, you could only gather enough manna for one day. And if you stockpiled the manna, it would breed worms, and it would rot, it would smell awful, it would just go bad. And so in this story, and what the people were to remember, uh, it was really a couple of things. First of all, is that God will provide you for what you need today. Sometimes we get really worried about and we become completely overwhelmed about all the different things that are in our life and how in the world are we going to sort through all of these different things. God is our provider. He has promised us he's going to give us exactly what we need today. That's why the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. He'll give you the strength for today and guess what's going to happen tomorrow? He's going to give you the strength that you need for tomorrow. 
Guess what's going to happen a couple days from now? He's going to give you the strength then too. Why? Because God is always our provider. The other thing that they were to remember in this is that when you stockpile and when you go after excess, basically it's going to rot. It's going to smell. It's not going to be a good thing. So we take what God has given us f to cover our needs, and then we need to use the excess in a way that pleases God. And that's really when it comes down to our finances too, right? God has given us what we need to cover our basic needs. Sometimes we want more than that. Okay, that's the normal part. But he's given us everything for our basic needs. And when he gives us excess, the question is, what do we do with that, right? We need to use the resources we've been given to further his kingdom. It's behind that. So we need to remember all these different things. Now, when the people looked back and remembered this manna, um, honestly, it was quite shameful for them. Do you have anything in your past that you wish you could forget? Right? You're like, oh man, when I think about this, it just kind of takes me here. And oh, that was embarrassing. Oh, I was so full of pride. Oh, I, you know, I was entitled back then. Well, that's what would have happened with the Israelites when, when they thought back on manna. Because, you know, God was providing for them, but they wanted more. So Numbers chapter 11, it says, And the people complained in the hearing of the Lord about their misfortunes. Oh, poor people, right? Misfortunes can sometimes be translated as hardship. Think about this. They are less than 13 months away from having been in slavery for 430 years. They obviously have forgotten what slavery is like. And if you remember this from last week, envy makes you forget God's goodness and God's faithfulness. Instead of being content with what they were given, this is how they responded. Verse 4 of Numbers 11. This is interesting. And the people of Israel also wept again. <laughs> And said, oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that what? That cost nothing. Why did it cost nothing? They were slaves. They had nothing, right? Of course it cost nothing. And then they said the cucumbers. Oh, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. They are about a year out from being released from slavery, and they forgot what slavery was like. Look how stupid they are when they're talking this way. They're like, oh man, you remember the food back in the good old days? Back when we were chained up? Oh man. Oh, I remember, oh, the, those onions, they were exquisite. And they forgot about what slavery was like. They forgot they were chained up. They were they're being beaten. People were dying. And they're like, oh, I wish I had all of this. It's crazy. They forgot that slavery wasn't good. And they failed to relish in the freedom that they had now. Even Moses himself, as he's leading the people through uh, the wilderness in Deuteronomy chapter 8, he says that the people's feet, they did not even swell, which means that they had all the nourishment that they needed, but they wanted more. See, the Israelites, they seem to have forgotten that their whole situation was temporary and that God was sending them into a literal promised land that the Bible says was full of what? Milk and honey. And the modern day equivalent is what? Like, I don't know, blooming onions and cheesecakes. Just wait. Just get, you know, get there. I have something prepared for you. Be content in what I am giving you right now. We always have to remind you that God will supply our needs. Everything that we ever need to accomplish his will on this earth, he will give it to us. I love what William Arthur Ward said. He says, God's strength behind you, his concern for you, his love within you, and his arms beneath you are more than sufficient for the job ahead of you. That's pretty good, isn't it? All right, last point. Remember God is the God of second chances. You thankful for that? He's got a third chances and fourth chances sometimes too, but God is the God of second chances. So let's put all the pieces of this story together. 40 years again prior to Joshua chapter 4, the Israelites, they were standing at the edge of the promised land. They just had to cross the water and take the land. God says, go and do it. But they got nervous. They got scared. Their lives were filled with anxiety. What if we try this and it just doesn't work out? And so what do they do? 
They did the exact same thing that the University of Michigan is doing right now. They sent in 12 spies to check out the land. And I'm a Michigan fan, so I'm just kind of making fun of ourselves right now too, right? But they sent in 12 spies to check out what the land was going to be like. And you know, this Connor Stallions, he was there too, just kind of taking notes and trying to figure out their signs of like, can we defeat the giants in the land right now? And they're like, man, I don't know. I don't think we can do it. They let obstacles come in their way from following God. They did. They're like, oh man, we can't defeat these giants. And they have totally forgot how big their God is and how faithful he's been to them over and over and over and over again. Now, Joshua chapter 4, the nation of Israel, they have a second chance at it. And you know what they did this time? They remember, they looked back at the stones and they remembered God's faithfulness. They remember that God would always deliver. They remember that God would be the provider. And they remembered he will always go before us. And when he goes before us, we will win that battle. And so they took those steps of faith and they entered in to the promised land. Four years ago, we were... You could say we were standing at the edge of the river. And those of you who were here four years ago, all of us, we took a big step of faith not knowing what God would do. As a result of that, many things got accomplished for the kingdom of God. And we've said this over and over again the last few weeks, but this year, this calendar year, we've seen 213 people give their life to Jesus. That is absolutely amazing what he's doing right now. The things that God is doing right now is the result of us taking some of those steps of faith and God working through us to accomplish his will in this area. We're at the edge of the river again. God's calling us to take some more steps of faith right now. And I don't know about you, but I like to dream about what that could look like four years from now. If we've seen him being faithful in the past to bring us to right here, what is he going to do these next few years? How many more people in our community are going to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ next year and the year after and the year after and the year after that? So today, God, he's calling us to take a step of obedience. Over the last four weeks, we've been praying that same prayer. It's up here on the screen behind me, Lord, what do you want to do through me at Port City Church so that more can be found? Now here's the exciting part of today. If you've been faithfully praying that prayer and just being open to wherever God was leading you, today we get to follow through and follow him. So just in a moment, we're going to give you a time to respond. And with our hearts fully surrendered to him, It's time to follow. So as you came in, there were pledge cards on every seat, and we've been talking about this the last couple weeks. We have it up on the screen behind me. On the left-hand side of those pledge cards is the different totals of what it would be uh, if you were to give those certain amounts over the course of three years. Um, On the right-hand side, you see all the personal information that you can fill out. The important box on the right-hand side is what your total pledge is over the next three years. And again, this is above and beyond our regular giving. Now, you can give your pledges in a lot of different ways. You can set it up online for regular um, monthly gifts or weekly gifts or however you want to set that up. We also have giving envelopes out at the welcome desk in uh, the lobby that you can place in the offering. Some people in the past have given different gifts of stock and things like that. You can write that on the pledge card and we can give you the information that you need uh, for that. But when it comes down to it, in order to reach our goal so that more people can be reached with the gospel, it's really going to take all of us just simply listening to God and then following him. And how do we know if we're going to be successful in this campaign? Really, it's not about a dollar amount. It it honestly isn't. It's simply have we prayed, have we listened, and then have we followed. And if we've done those those three things, we'll be successful in whatever God has called us to do. Whether that amount be 700,000 or our goal of 1.35 million or if it's $3 million, the amount doesn't matter so much. We'll know we're successful if we're simply faithful to what God has called us to do. A couple of things before we take the time to fill these cards out. Uh, For those of you who don't have a lot of resources, I want to encourage you, don't fall into the trap thinking that your gift or your pledge doesn't matter. Because that's not how this whole thing works in following Jesus. God just simply wants a surrendered heart. And he'll take whatever it is that we give him, he will multiply that 
to do what he wants with it. You think through the stories of like the loaves and the fishes of how just a few of them were given to Jesus and Jesus multiplied those things. It's the same thing with these gifts. God doesn't need our money. He really doesn't. He just wants a heart that surrendered. So again, don't fall into that trap that, you know, it might not make any difference. And then there's some of you in this room right now that God has entrusted you with a lot more resources. And for you, somebody, you're looking at somebody's sacrifice of maybe $200. That might be a sacrifice for them, but maybe for you, that sacrifice might be $200,000 or seven figures or whatever that is. I don't really care about the amount. I don't. For all of you, I just want you to be praying this prayer and responding to however he leads you. So we're not going to rush this time at all. We're going to give you the time that you need to fill out the card if you feel like God is calling you to that. Um, JP and Eli, uh, they'll be making noise behind me and uh, playing some songs behind me, a little background music and all of that. But during this time, we simply just want you to be listening to God. Okay? Um, Pray, God, what do you want to do through me at Port City Church so that more can be found in whatever he places on your heart? Put that on the card. When you're done filling out that card, I'd encourage you to take a moment and pray a prayer of commitment over that card. God, take this and multiply it so that more people can be found. And then when you're done with that, whenever that time is, you can get up out of your seat and over here, uh, we have a cross. And at the foot of the cross, we have a basket that's there. You can go ahead and drop your pledge cards in there. Now this will be mass chaos as we go ahead and do this. Um, but I encourage you to just take your time as whenever you're ready, you can come up to the front. You can go over, drop the, uh, the pledge cards in the basket over there, and you can walk around the backside to your seat. And again, there's no pressure, especially if you're a guest. Just, if you're a guest, just be inspired that there's a group of people that desperately will be willing to do anything so that more people can be found in him. So I'm going to say a word of prayer over us. Then I'm just going to give you the time that you need to fill those out. And then I'll come back up and I'll read some scripture. And then we'll close out our service. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you uh, for the way that you're working right now in our midst. Lord, we thank you for all the people, um, especially this last year, that have given their life to Jesus. And Lord, more than anything, we just want to see your will accomplished here in this area, that your mission will be fulfilled. And so show us our part that we can play in it. And Lord, I pray that we'd have hearts surrendered and that we'd step out in faith, trusting you that you are always faithful. So join with us, lead us during this time. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So you have a few minutes, take the time that you need, and when you are ready, go ahead and put the pledge cards in the baskets.
Last night, our elders and our staff, we, we got together and uh, had a really special night of prayer um, and a time where we were able to also make our pledges and our commitments together. And uh, I'm just so thankful for the leadership that we have in the church. And I want you all to know that we all have been praying for you uh, as we follow God in this. It's really a, a spiritual journey that we're all on that we want to invite other people in with it too so that they can receive the healing and the strength that they need that's only found in Jesus. So I want to read our kind of our theme verses from this series as Matthew chapter 7. And then when I'm done reading these verses, I'm going to invite you to stand and we'll sing our, our firm foundation song together. So Matthew 7 verse 24 says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell. And great was the fall of it. We want to be that group of people that have built our house upon that rock. So will you stand with me? I'm going to say a word of prayer, then we'll sing this song out together. God, we, we love you and we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that because of him, we can have a future that lasts. That because of him, our lives have been changed and that because of him, this community can be changed with the power of the gospel. So Lord, I pray that you would go before us and win those battles. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. i 
will never fail us. He's been faithful in the past. He's faithful right now. He's going to be faithful in the future. That is who he is. I had a few people after last service ask me, hey, uh, is it all right if I turn it in next week? It's totally fine. Um, we're doing a big celebration two weeks from now on the 19th. And in that celebration, we're not celebrating the amount so much. We're going to be celebrating the amount of people that have jumped in and, and said, hey, I followed God in this and this is what he led me to give. And, and so two weeks from now, we're going to celebrate that. And we'll talk about what next steps God has for us. So that's two weeks from now. Another thing, if you are here today and you're here the stuff about Jesus right now, you're like, man, I'd like to know more about him because you're talking about how he can change everything. Talk to us about that, okay? Stop by the welcome desk out there in the lobby or just grab me, tackle me before we get out of here today. I'd love to share with you how Jesus will change everything in your life. So guys, I, I appreciate you. Thank you. I thank all of you for listening to God and then following him. And man, it's going to be fun in the future, isn't it? It's fun right now. It's going to be really fun in the future as we continue to follow him in all these ways. What's it going to look like? I don't know, but God does. And it's going to be bigger than anything we can imagine. Kind of remember these verses, Ephesians chapter 3. Let's say these last two verses together. 2021. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you guys for coming out today. You are released to be the people of God.